have a fair number of people who are not immune, people who are unvaccinated. Now at six, a measles outbreak gets worse, where thousands of Oregonians may have been exposed. And more fallout from sexual assault charges against a major Oregon Democratic fundraiser. The new lawyer for the accuser explains what's different this time around. Apparently, six to eight inches of our property line or our property planner box is on their property. How this woman got Peabot to reroute a major project around her home after it threatened to take part of her property. Well, this is uh, one outbreak that we're having. It's just growing. So just minutes ago, Clark County uh, officials are declaring a public health emergency due to a spike in measles cases. That does mean the county will get me more resources to deal with this outbreak. So far, there have been nearly 20 confirmed cases. One doctor saying that that number could easily climb. There are also some new places we need to tell you about where people may have been exposed. The latest place where people may have been exposed to this highly contagious disease was last week's Blazers game. We have team coverage tonight. Kristen Severance is taking a closer look at the facts and some of the misconceptions around the virus. But we want to start with KGW's Joe Ranieri. He's live at the Moda Center. Joe, this is so troubling. Thousands of people were at that game. Absolutely right. Now, Dan Laurel, that game was scheduled a week ago tonight on January 11th here at the Moda Center. Now, a doctor I spoke with is concerned that there could be more exposures just because how many people were at last week's game. 19 confirmed cases of measles, seven suspected cases, all in less than a month. Symptoms of measles, uh, runny nose, uh, cough, uh, uh, fever, uh, red eye, those are the pink eye, those are really common at this time of year. So, but you're exquisitely contagious um, at that time and you can transmit the disease to others. But Dr. Alan Melnick with the Clark County Department of Health says he's expecting to see more cases develop. And we're still working on the, the relationship between these cases, but we now have public sites of exposure. So uh, this, as this develops, we're seeing more, we're gonna see more cases out there in the community. One of the latest places where people may have been exposed was last Friday's Blazer game at the Moda Center. Melnick says there's an easy prevention. We wouldn't be dealing with this um, if we if we had the entire population were vaccinated. So far out of the 19 cases, 15 of them have been children 10 years or younger. In one case, a patient was hospitalized. We've got a potentially deadly disease that's exquisitely contagious and we have a very effective and very safe and very cheap uh, prevention for it, specifically uh, measles. Uh, vaccination. He also says there are people who are not listening about how highly contagious this disease is. There's a lot of misinformation uh, besides the misinformation about the vaccine going on social media. There's a lot of misinformation about how uh, deadly this disease is. Melnick hopes this latest outbreak is eye opening for people. This is not a benign disease. This can be a very serious disease. We take it very seriously and it's very preventable. Now, we have a full list on our website at KGW.com of potential places that could have been affected by the outbreak. Back to you. Thank you, Joe. And we know there are a lot of questions about this outbreak. Yeah, absolutely. KGW's Kristen Severance here now to verify some of the facts here, clear up some misconceptions about this virus and how it spread. Kristen. Yeah, there are so many questions. We're even talking about it in the newsroom. So many of us have questions. Okay, so question number one, is the measles vaccine safe? Dr. Melnick, who you just heard from, says yes, the measles vaccine is safe. Now, there are medical reasons not to get it, like maybe someone who is pregnant, but this is something most of us received as children. If you did not get it as a child, you can still get it. It's two shots, 28 days apart. The first shot is 93% effective. The second shot is 97% effective. And if you did not get the shot and you do get measles, you need to stay out of school or work for one to three weeks. Okay, let's go to our second question. Should I go to the ER or a doctor if I think I have measles? We can verify the answer is no. You want to call your doctor's office because if you just go there or go to the ER, you risk infecting everyone there. Third question, is there a treatment if I do get measles? No, we can verify there is no treatment for measles. The symptoms include coughing, uh, runny nose, pink eyes, and then you will get the rash. If you do get it, it could last between one to three weeks. And our fourth question here, can the measles virus be deadly? 
The answer is yes. So Dr. Melnick says this is a deadly disease. It can be deadly. The death rate is one to three people out of 1000 cases. He says that doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a high number. Bottom line here, Dr. Melnick says this is very serious. The vaccine is safe. Dr. Melnick and the CDC, they're saying that this vaccine will not give your child autism and we all need to take this very seriously. Which is a very controversial topic, mm -hmm. but something people need to hear. This yeah. is a really serious situation, as yeah. the doctor said. Thank you, Kristen. You bet. You've been paying an extra gas tax every time you fill up in Portland. Voters approved it back in 2016, and now that money is about to be spent. The largest project from the Fixing Our Streets gas tax will improve a stretch of Capitol Highway near Multnomah Village. But will the city uh, have to take homeowners' property just to get this project done? KGW's Chris Willis is live in the newsroom for us. And Chris, a lot of people say these improvements are long overdue. They do. People who live along Capitol Highway have been trying to get these improvements for decades. And this project is big. Bike lanes and sidewalks will make it safer for everyone. But the question is, at what cost? A local woman says her property line sits right in the middle of all this progress. It'll be a comfortable space for people to walk, bike, and still to drive. It is the single largest improvement project funded by the Fixing Our Streets gas tax that voters passed in 2016. And most agree this stretch of Capitol Highway is not only in bad shape, it's downright dangerous. It is tough, particularly when I walk the dog, because yeah. I have to go around cars out onto Capitol Highway, and I don't like that. In some spots, a mere inches stand between cars and trucks whizzing past walkers and joggers. People waiting for the bus stand in mud, and cyclists try to avoid it altogether. But the Portland Bureau of Transportation says that's about to change. So we're going to see bike lanes going both directions along Southwest Capitol Highway between, so between Garden Home and Taylor's Ferry Road. Uh, we will see sidewalks. The speed limit will also drop. Neighbors tell us the project will make a big difference. I can walk my grandchildren down. We hear over and over again from people how excited they are for this to happen. Southwest Portland residents are thrilled to see more connections into Mullen Village, which is such a wonderful part of Portland. Excited? Thrilled? Hold on just a second. Not everybody. So apparently, 68 inches of our property line or our property planner box is on their property. Andrea Furpo and her family live in this house, right in the middle of Peabot's improvement project. Our drone Fly 8 gives a good perspective. That's Andrea's house on the right. I really do believe they've spent a small fortune designing an oasis in their backyard, and Peabot says a few inches of this concrete planter box, which was there when they bought their home, is actually on city property. And so that was never made clear to us in the sale of the house, and it never was important until this project came along right. and the city decided that they'd like to take it. If the city takes six to eight inches of that concrete planter box, Andrea says so they would destroy the entire thing. Right How long does this run, this, this whole that stretch? That runs all the way to the front of our property, all the way to the end. And leave new sidewalks just inches from her house. So she got active, sent flyers to neighbors, took to social media, went to the Urban Forestry Commission meeting, and eventually to City Council and says she just couldn't get answers. There is some space that is public right of way between the actual road and properties on the streets. So we called Peabot, set up an interview, and asked them about Andrea's concerns. We're looking to just make it as least of an impact, but also create the best project as possible. You should be able to. And that project does include Andrea's backyard, or at least it did, because Peabot stepped it up, sending us a statement saying they've designed a solution to save that planter box and Andrea's backyard. Peabot says the design solution includes narrowing the proposed pedestrian, bicycle, transit improvements from 18 feet behind the curb down to 15 feet. In addition, we're going to add a construction note in the plans requiring the contractor to protect and maintain the integrity of the planter box. I'm pleased that there's movement there, and I'm pleased that somebody's actually listening. Well, Peabot has held over 60 site visits with people who live in that area. In addition to the continuous sidewalks and protected bike lanes, Peabot says the project will include a multi-use path, pedestrian crossings, even stormwater improvements. A request for proposal for a construction manager and a general contractor are going out this month. Dan? All right, Chris. Thank you, sir. If you have a story for our investigative team, email investigators at kgw.com or call our tip line at 503-226-5041. Thank <laughs> you.
So we're learning much more today about allegations against prominent Democratic fundraiser and political donor Terry Bean. He faces new charges of having sex with a 15 year old boy in Eugene in 2013. Bean has faced these charges before, but they were dismissed when that victim refused to testify. New legal documents paint a better picture of why that first case fell apart and why prosecutors are now able to file it again. Pat Doris has been digging into this case for us. Pat, what'd you find out? Well, Laurel and Dan, documents from the Oregon State Bar show that there are some holes that have been filled in now in this case. They detail allegations from the victim who says Terry Bean paid $220,000 to the victim's lawyer around the time the first criminal case was set for trial. Big question now, what was that money for? Beanside said it was simply to settle the threat of a civil lawsuit, but others are not buying it. Mr. Bean, Pat Doris, KGW, wonder if you have a comment? No, thanks. Terry the Bean didn't want to talk about the new case yesterday when he got out of the I Lane County Jail. No but his attorney issued a statement later okay. suggesting the teen accuser just wants more money, saying Mr. Bean is the victim and he has paid enough. Later in the day, someone posted on Bean's Facebook page, visible only to friends, an explanation for that payment around the first criminal case, that he had made a business decision to settle a civil suit in order to focus on proving his innocence in the criminal case. But it appears there never was a civil suit filed in court. And even if that was the case, any lawyer will tell you a civil settlement cannot keep someone from testifying in a criminal case. So what happened? I posed that question to the victim's attorney, Sean Riddell. The victim has always wanted to participate in the criminal justice process. He was a victim of Ms. Devaney, he was a victim of Ms. Devaney's scam, and he was a victim of Ms. Devaney's lies. Sean Riddell is the new lawyer representing the teen. He would not say what the scam was specifically, but it obviously led to the alleged victim not testifying in that first criminal case. And without his testimony, the case fell apart and was dismissed. Ms. Devaney is Lori Devaney, a well-known Portland lawyer who lived a lavish lifestyle and appears to have stolen from clients. The state bar which oversees lawyers took the rare step of seizing Devaney's practice three months ago, including all her files. 26 clients have already filed claims for $1.5 million that they say Devaney stole from them. The teen accuser in the Terry Bean case is one of those clients. Documents he filed with the state bar show a payment of $220,000 into a trust account for him held by Devaney. Some was held out for lawyer fees and he did get a few thousand dollars, but the teen says Devaney still owes him $127,000. He understands uh, the importance and he very much wants to participate in the criminal justice process. And here's an obvious question. Isn't it witness tampering to pay a witness to not appear at trial? Well, it is indeed, but remember, Beanside says that's not what the money was for at all. One person who could shed more light on that would be the teen's first lawyer, Ms. Devaney. She faces at least two federal investigations and one from Portland police. It is always possible that she could try to cut a deal and flip, sharing her version of what happened and why that teen did not testify back at that first criminal trial. Back to you, Sting. It sounds like more chapters to this oh, story. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. We're also following the money tonight. As we've been mentioning, Bean has been a prominent Democratic donor, and now some of those politicians are giving his donations back. KGW's Maggie Vespa joins us now. Well, some of them are giving it back, Maggie. Others <laughs> are not. Yeah, Dan, exactly. Some telling us tonight, you know, hey, the guy's not convicted at this point, so for now, we are reserving judgment, a.k.a. they're keeping the money. Again, for now, Bean himself isn't saying anything at all. Terry Bean was home today. We can call his attorney? Sure. Okay. Thank but he didn't want to talk to us. <laughs> so instead, we'll show you this YouTube video of him dancing with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. It was posted on what appears to be Bean's Facebook page, as was a months old ad for a summer soiree, aka a campaign fundraiser for now Portland City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty. Hi, Joanne Hardesty. Hardesty won that race in November. Today, she's not commentating on the $3,500 contribution being made to her campaign, one of many in recent years for the prominent Democratic donor. Now, some are giving the money back. Yesterday, Oregon Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum refunded Bean's $2,150. Senator Ron Wyden says he's doing the same. Bean gave his campaign $125. Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici got rid of Bean's money months ago. Campaign staff tell KGW back in April they gave his $2,500 contribution 
to the Oregon Food Bank. KGW also reached out to the campaigns of Senator Jeff Merkley and Congressman Earl Blumenauer. They also received donations from Bean, but have yet to respond. Same story for candidates across the country, including Claire McCaskill in Missouri. Good to see all of you. And Beto O'Rourke in Texas. Both lost their bids for Senate. We reached out to their campaigns, but haven't yet heard back. Back here at home, City Commissioner Nick Fish is, for now, keeping Bean's campaign contract contributions, $750 since 2017. Fish saying Bean, quote, has been indicted, which means there is a charge against him, but he's presumed innocent. I do not plan on returning a contribution now, but I reserve the right to change my opinion based on what happens in the future. And from that statement to another one, the Democratic Party of Oregon also issuing a statement. They wrote in part, quote, Mr. Bean has consistently denied this set of allegations and the public did not have the opportunity to hear from the alleged victim. It goes on to say we will assess our future relationship with Mr. Bean once there has been a resolution in court or more evidence from the alleged victim is made public. Bean had given them $1,800 over the last two years. Guys, back to you. Lots of layers to this one. Thank you to Maggie and Pat for your coverage on this story. And we are going to continue to track it, of course. Stay with us on air and online at KGW.com, as well as our mobile app to stay up to date with this story and others. I didn't notice any significant, at least that I was aware of, significant symptoms until I stacked a few of the concussions into one year. Coming up, winter sports and concussions. The symptoms you need to know to be able to understand the difference between a bump on the head and something much more serious. And it has been a soaker of a Friday afternoon here in the Rose City. This is a live look at radar and we're starting to see the back edge of the heavy rain now work its way into the Portland metro area. So I think the rain starts to ease back a little bit, but boy, uh, it's still coming down in some parts of the area. The winds are also going to ratchet up a little bit tonight. More on that with your full forecast in just a few minutes.